Hey everyone, what I'd like to do today is show you how to use the Roland Bridgecast mixer and audio interface. Roland released this premium audio device at the start of 2023, but they sent it out to me two or three weeks before launch. So I've had two or three months to use the Bridgecast and test it with many different microphones. So they're promoting this as a dual bus gaming mixer and it's easy to see why you've got controls for your microphone, auxiliary port, chat and game, etc. But this is a versatile audio interface. You can use this for content creation. I'm sure musicians would love it as well. It's just a versatile audio device. So if you'd like to know more about this, if you want to know exactly what this is about, a quick summary of what this can do, please do check out my review. It's a short overview and it will explain what the functionality is and give you my opinion on it. But what this video is, is a long tutorial. I'm making no qualms about this. This is a long video. And this video is for people who are thinking of buying the Bridgecast or people who have already bought it and they simply want some clarification over some features. So I'm going to be showing you how to set this up. I'm going to be talking about the ports, all the controls. I'm going to be talking about the Bridgecast app and I'll be using my microphone here to do a lot of microphone tests as well. You know, it helps show the controls. It is a long ass video, so please do check the timeline below. Please feel free to skip to the part which is relevant to you. And without further ado, let's check out the Roland Bridgecast. Let's start this tutorial on the official sales page of the Roland Bridgecast. This is a great starting point because it shows you all of its features and it gives you a great overview as to what this can do. And you'll see all of the marketing material here. And you can see that it's marketed towards game streamers. But this is also where you'll find the specifications as to what this device can do. And it's also where you will see downloads and will help you install the drivers, etc. But my top tip before we get started is to go to the support page and you'll see the owner's manual in HTML and PDF format. And that is my top tip before you start going is to read the owner's manual. Now, when you first buy this, you'll you know, you'll power it up, you'll switch it on, you'll plug in your microphone and you'll start playing around with this to see what it can do. That's all good, but I encourage you, I strongly encourage you to refer to this owner's manual. I've used a lot of audio interfaces over the years and I would say this is the best manual I've ever had to reference. Now, there's a few things, you know, with setting up games consoles, maybe they should expand upon, but on the whole, this is a fantastic manual. And if you read it, you understand how to get the most from this device. You understand how all the ports work, all the controls work, you'll know how to use the Bridgecast app as well. This video is in essence a companion to that manual. So please refer to it. I will be referring to it myself throughout this video. But yeah, if you do buy this device or if you've not bought it yet and you're just looking for some clarification on some features, please check out the manual. It's fantastic and it, it does a wealth of information in there. The normal way to connect an audio mixer or interface to a computer, a tablet, a smartphone is to connect one side of the cable to the interface and the other side to the computer or tablet or phone in question. And that's exactly what you do here. But there's a few things here that could trip you up and there's a few things to note. So I want to clarify how this works. At the back of the device here, you've got all the ports and I will explain all of these in a while, but right now I just want to focus on the 5 volt type C port, the USB type C port and the switch which shows console, mobile or PC. Now the 5 volt port here is there for additional power to ensure that the interface, the mixer has enough power. It's the USB port here which you need to connect to your computer, whether it be laptop, desktop, PC, tablet, smartphone, whatever. You need to connect to this port to ensure that the interface is recognized. If, for example, I connected the type C cable here to my computer, five volts to my computer, it's, it's not gonna be recognized. They just won't even know that this exists. So you have to use that USB port. Now, the Roland Bridgecast comes with two cables. It comes with two two meter cables. The first cable is type C, to type A, and the other cable is type C to type C. And like I say, two meters long, both of the cables are two meters long. And that is great because I reviewed an audio interface recently, which 
had a cable which was like that size. It was like six inches long. It was completely impractical. It couldn't reach my computer or my hub and I had to use a replacement cable. So you've got everything that you need here. Two two meter long cables, type C to type C and type A to type C. So for most people, what I recommend to connect and power the Roland Bridgecast is to set the switch to PC and use the USB port here, like so, and plug the other side in, Type-C to Type-C. So I'm using a Thunderbolt hub over there, and it powers on, and that's it loading up, and my computer is recognizing that this has been connected. Now, the one thing to note here is the brightness level. Those colors are as bright as you can get them. Now, if you connect using the Type-C, the Type-A cable, the interface will work in exactly the same way. You won't have any problems with your microphones, but you will notice that the lights are a little bit dimmer. Now, that is by design. Roland are playing it safe. And if you look at the manual, they explain this in detail. They call Type-C to Type-C full mode, and they call Type-C to Type-A save mode and they lower the brightness level. Now, if you're using type A, the type A connection there, it might be prudent to also power this with five volts, but apart from the colors there, you know, just being a little bit dimmer, I did not see any issues with using the type A connection. The microphones still sounded great. I still got 48 volts for the condenser microphone, etc. No issues at all. But that five volts port is there to provide full power and give you full brightness and ensure everything is running okay. I don't think I would use it with the Type-A connection personally, it's there if you want it, but if, for example, you switch this to console mobile and you are connecting to an iPad or to your smartphone, for example, you want to also connect the 5 volt port. So you can imagine this goes into a smartphone, you also want to connect the 5 volt port option here so that you can power it because your smartphone is not going to power an audio mixer. You're going to have issues there. So the five volts there is is there as an option in case you're powering, you know, connecting to an iPad or something that's not giving it full power. It's more of a fail safe, in my opinion. But yes, for most people, I would say Type C to Type C. Now, this is compatible with Windows and Mac, but there isn't a driver yet for the Mac. But they have said, if I can get it here in the manual, they have said that the, the um, if you get it here they have said it's coming april 2023 so in the meantime just switch pc to console mobile if you are using a mac so to summarize it's very easy to connect this to your computer use this usb port if you're using something like a tablet or smartphone you have that five volt option there for additional power you now know how to connect the Roland bridge cast to your computer and to other devices so that's what I'm going to do just now. Like I said, if you're a Mac user and there's no driver available for you just now, select console mobile. And that's also what you'll select for connecting to tablets and smartphones, etc. Once a driver is available, you will select PC. And I'm connecting to Windows just now, so that is what I'm going to use. So I'm using the Type-C to Type-C cable. I'm going into the USB port and I will also connect the Untangled here also connect my XLR cable. So this goes to my microphone, which is to the side of me here. And if I kind of bump it here, you'll see the levels going up there for the mic. So once you've got the Roland Bridgecast connected to your computer, you want to go to that official sales page area again, go to the download section and install the driver. So Mac users will get this driver soon, but Windows users have it already. You download that USB driver, you install it, and that will allow the BridgeCast to communicate with your computer. That's going to allow the BridgeCast to be recognized. You can then install the BridgeCast app, and that's available for Windows and Mac, version 101 as I record this. And once you've installed that app, if I get to my monitor, you will see the application. So when you load it up, you're going to see all the inputs, all the outputs, don't worry about this section just now. I'll explain all of this later. I'll explain all the menus later, but for now, 
all you need to know that is that once you've installed the driver, once you've installed the BridgeCast app, you've got your BridgeCast connected, you go to menu, you go to system, and then you update the firmware. And that will ensure that your BridgeCast is using the latest firmware. It's got all the bug fixes and whatnot. So when you get this out of the box, it's probably got 1.00. I've got 1.04 installed. It does say 105 there, but as you can see, that version doesn't seem to be available. It seems to be a little bit of a bug there as far as the reporting goes. So yes, USB driver, BridgeCast app. And once you've got that BridgeCast app, you can update the firmware in this device. So if I minimize the app for a second, you will see the Windows sound settings area and you'll see outputs and you'll see inputs. Now, if I double back and show my browser again, I want to show you this area because here it says PC, dedicated driver, audio four in, three out. And for console mobile, it shows you standard OS driver, audio one in, one out. So you can see that here with PC, you've got more options. You've got a MIDI connection, four in, three out. And if you want to be technical about this, you can refer to their mixer block diagram. So they've got diagrams for PC, and then they've got diagrams for the console mobile option. And you can see there's less options there as far as outputs and inputs. Now, it is quite technical, it's quite complicated. When you look at this, it's a little bit bamboozling. But once you start looking at all the inputs and once you understand the software, this diagram actually starts to make sense. So not something you should look at right away, but later on you might want to refer to it. So again, the PC, you've got four in, three out. So what that means is there's three outputs of the bridge cast. And the three outputs here will translate into three inputs into your computer. So three outputs of this mixer means three inputs in your computer. And those three inputs are personal, microphone, and stream. So microphone, self-explanatory, that's your XLR input, that's your microphone. And you can select that as an input. You can select it in Discord, in Teams, Zoom. You can select it in OBS, whatever you're using to record. But the other two options are personal and stream. So if I show you my overhead camera, you'll see here, stream mix and personal mix. And that's why the Rolling Bridgecast is classified as a dual bus gaming mixer because you've got two options here, stream mix and personal mix. So you can imagine you're streaming on Twitch, you're streaming on YouTube. Stream mix is what you would output to the world. I mean, if you wanted to, you could, if you could just let everyone hear your microphone and that's it, but you want to really give them the stream mix. I mean, your stream mix, you might want to put the microphone up or put the game up or, you know, turn the auxiliary down. However, you've got it set up, you want to adjust things. But for your personal mix, you may want to change some things. Put music up, put music down, put the game up or game down. You want to adjust things so that everything's good for you. And that's a fantastic option because it allows you to get the perfect balance for yourself and then the perfect balance for everyone else. And I know from doing live streams in the past, they, they aren't always the same. So when you're in Windows or when you're on your computer, you have the option of using the personal mix, the stream mix, or the microphone mix. Now up here, it's a little bit different. So for your outputs, and again, this corresponded to four in, but in Windows, that's going as outputs. Um, up here, you've got a few options. You've got game, you've got system, so your system sounds, you've got chat, and you've got music. Now right away, game, system, chat, and music, you'll notice that those are different to what's here, microphone, auxiliary, chat, and game. But if I show you the software again, show you the, the BridgeCast app, you'll see that although you've got four channels here that you can control like directly on the hardware, you've got seven inputs here. You've got your microphone, you've got auxiliary, you've got chat and game, but then you've also got music, system, and effects, special effects, SFX. And the four inputs that Windows are seeing there are system, music, game, and chat. So that's what those correspond to. So again, what you're really doing here, when you're getting connected, you're powering in using the correct setting, and then you're installing the driver, you're installing the, the BridgeCast app, and then you're making sure that you've got the right inputs going to where you want them to. Now, what I'm gonna do now is take this USB connection off, I'm going to change to console mobile, 
And I just want to demonstrate something because when you've got that um, console mobile connection, that option, you'll notice here, it now says digital audio interface bridgecast. It doesn't give me game and music and system, it just says bridgecast. And it's the same with the input. It just says bridgecast. One in, one out. So if you, if I switch to my browser here, you can see four in, three out with PC, but if you choose that console mobile option, there's one in, there's one out. You don't have the flexibility that you've got when you've got that PC connection. What I've said so far about setting up the rolling bridge cast should be sufficient for 99% of people or more. I don't envision many people having problems setting up the rolling bridge cast. This mixer just works. You install the USB driver, you install the bridge cast app, and then using the bridge cast app, you update the firmware, and then you just configure your inputs and outputs. If you run into any kind of connection problems, any kind of driver problems, there is an option. And when you install the driver, you also get this. And this is the BridgeCast driver settings. It's just a little configuration box. Now, I wouldn't change anything here unless you run into problems. I wouldn't even open it up unless you run into some problems. There's not a lot to change here anyway. You know, here you've got the sample rate, and the BridgeCast mixer supports 44,100, 48,000, and 96,000 hertz. Now, sometimes when I've selected this, there's all three options and you can change between it, but I am connected to another audio interface and I'm recording with it right now, so it's saying 96,000. And then it's got audio buffer size. So it's defaulted to six, but you can go between one and 10. There's the ASIO buffer size, and you've got a default and revert, so you can revert settings, default settings, etc. Another key thing here is show the README, and that's something I wanted to show you. So this is the README file, which you saw in that configuration box, and that explains how that configuration box works, and it's got a lot of other troubleshooting things here as well. So it's got advice here, you know, you can see it down the left-hand side, it's got reinstalling the driver, uninstalling the driver, changing driver settings. There's a lot here, and you only really have to refer to this kind of guide if you're running into problems, if it's not working right or something doesn't sound right. Now, the one thing is maybe worth checking though, if you are looking to change those driver settings, is the audio buffer size. And this says here, de decreasing the buffer size will shorten the latency and improve real-time performance, but will make it more likely that you experience audio clicks and pops. Increasing the buffer size will lengthen the latency, but it could make the audio stream more stable and we are less likely for audio clicks and pops to occur. So if you've got any kind of issues on OBS, on whatever recording uh, application that you're using to broadcast to Twitch, to YouTube, whatever, if, if something isn't sounding right, you might want to go back to those driver settings. You might want to change the buffer size. You might want to play around with that. Like I said, for 99% plus of people, you don't have to refer to that guide. You don't have to adjust settings and it's probably best that you don't but that driver settings box is there if you need it. So I've disconnected the Type-C cable and the XLR cable so that we can take a closer look at the hardware itself. And we can talk about how you can brand this mixer and we can take a closer look at the rear inputs as well. Now on the official website, there is a specifications area and it tells you a lot of great information about the inputs, the dials, what this is capable of, you know, from a, an audio perspective. And it talks about compatibility with Microsoft Windows with Apple Mac OS and Apple iOS. And down at the bottom here, we've got its dimensions and its weight or 450 grams or one pound. And certainly when you pick this up for the first time, it feels deceivingly weighty for its size. It feels a little bit heavier than what it should be, you know, given its size. And that's because this is a premium product. You know, it's got an aluminium build here at the front. There, there is some plastic here. You can see the, the base is plasticky. But for the most part, this feels a, it feels like a very premium product. And it's not just the build, you know, it's everything has that feel. For example, if I connect this back up for a second, you saw this earlier, when you plug this in, you know, all the colors light up, all the dials are lighting up here. And the buttons are all clicky. They're all responsive. All the dials feel great to move around. And it's just great to use. It just feels like a premium product. You know, the dials, the buttons, the build quality, they've done a great job here. 
So you can see the base is plasticky. There's four pads here to stop this scraping your desk. But one thing, it seems like a little thing, but it's worth pointing out. One thing I like about this is the position. See, you've got this 45 degree angle here, and then there's a little wedge here at the bottom. And that means that all the dials, all the controls here for the panel, they're all in a fantastic position. You can see everything. You can see all levels. You can control everything. There's nothing, there's nothing being hidden. Now, that seems like a minor thing to bring up. It sounds like it's obvious and all audio interfaces should work like that. They don't. I've used four or five audio interfaces myself, and I've seen a lot more that have a kind of flat design, which means that in practice with a lot of other audio interfaces, you might you know, control these ones and see the levels, but there's always a button at the back. There's always a control or indicator at the back, which you kind of need to lean over to see. Not the case here. It's a great angle and it's just really nice to use. So they've done a fantastic job in my opinion. So the Roland Bridgecast, what you'll see here is this top panel and you'll see there's four hex screws. And those are there because that top panel can be removed. So on the sales page, you'll see that there's an option to brand yourself and you can use your own faceplate. And this is undoubtedly going to be of interest to anyone who's streaming on Twitch, anyone streaming on YouTube, and they want to show off their whole streaming setup. And I mean, just look at how colorful and professional some of these designs look. Now, I had a call with Roland this week, a few days ago, and they spent over an hour with me clarifying some questions that I had. And one of the questions I had was about branding because I didn't see any faceplates for sale. I just assumed that it would be, you know, for sale. Uh, from Roland. Now they say that some third parties are selling faceplates for this already, but really this is something that you can do yourself. Under their guide article section, they have an article about personalizing your bridge cast. And what you just have to do is just use a hex key, remove those screws, and then you'll get the top panel. And then you can just cover it any way that you want. And you can see here, they've just got like a big vinyl sticker this one over and then you just make sure that it's all aligned properly and then you just reattach your faceplate and there you go, it looks like that. I mean, it does look fantastic. I really need to get around to doing this because I think it looks amazing when you do that. And they provide everything you need to do that. You can see down here, they've got the BridgeCast custom panel template. They give you some graphical files and, and some PDFs as well like this. And you can use that to just cut it out exactly how you want it and yeah, you can have a professional design and you can make this your own. You can put your own branding on there, your own color schemes in there, and you can show off to the world, I think. It's a small thing. It's not adding any functionality, but it's a nice touch. I really do think it's a nice touch. Let's talk about the inputs which are available in the rear panel of the Roland Bridgecast. So from left to right, we have a Kensington lock, and then we have a 5-volt Type-C input the USB Type-C input with the console mobile PC switch, line out, auxiliary in, XLR microphone, and then phones headset. Now, we know the 5 volt Type-C connection here, this is only for providing power. The USB connection is the one that you need to use to connect to your device, your computer, your tablet, or whatever. This is not just an input, and it's important to remember that. If you've got PC selected, it's four in, three out. If you've got mobile console selected, it's one in, one out. But the key thing is that this USB connection, this Type-C connection here is an in and an out, an input and an output. Next here, we have a TRS line out. Now this output can go to anything really. You can output the signal here to a mixer, another audio interface, some sort of musical effects or compressor, whatever you want. You can send the signal here using a line out cable like that. Very, very easy, very useful too. Next, we have an auxiliary in. Now, this supports TRS and TRRS. Now, you can use, again, if I use this cable as an example, you could use this to connect a games console, for example. You could connect your Nintendo Switch to grab the audio from that. Using an adapter, you can connect the Xbox, PlayStation. But if you connect this to a smartphone using a TRRS connection, then 
not only can you grab the audio from your smartphone, use that audio from your smartphone as an input, you can also output the microphone audio to your smartphone. Next up, we have the XLR microphone input. Now, this provides up to 48 volts of phantom power, and that's what you need to power a condenser microphone. Now, I'm still recording through my other audio interface at this time, but above me, I have a condenser shotgun microphone, and I use 48 volts of phantom power to power that microphone. But you can also use phantom power to power something like this. This is called effect head, and I use it to provide additional gain to dynamic microphones when they need them. But interestingly, I don't need to use this with my Shure SM7B because, you know, some audio interfaces provide 40 decibels of gain, some provide 60. The Roland Bridgecast provides up to 75 decibels of gain. Now, the numbers don't always tell you the full story. You get good preamps, you get bad preamps, but so far I've been very impressed with it and you'll hear it yourself soon. I've not been using the FET head with the Roland Bridgecast because I don't think it needs it. I think the gain that it has already is sufficient for that microphone and the Shure SM7B is a hungry microphone. So yeah, I'm, I've been very impressed with the preamp, very, um, you know, very clean signal. There's 75 decibels of gain to play around with there. There's no latency, et cetera, as well. So yeah, all good with the XLR input there. Done a good job there. So the last input here is phones, headsets. So headphones, you know, standard connection. And, you know, you'll see at the front here, I'll talk about this later, but you can control the headphone volume here. You can control the line out and stream there as well. But the other option here, as you can see, is headset. Now, if you look back at the manual, the, my manual, or the manual, which I keep referring to, if you look at the manual here, it says, use a headset with a 3.5 millimeter CTIA type mini plug, four pole, and you can use it like a headset. So this doesn't, this input at the back here, it doesn't just support headphones, it supports a headset. And lo and behold, I have a headset which is compatible. This is my Steel Series. I think it's called Arctis 3 console. So basically I use this with, you know, I use these headphones with this PC, but I also use it with my Xbox when the batteries and my wireless headset run out. So if I take the USB Type-C cable here, I'm gonna plug it in, and then I'm gonna plug this headset into the headset point. So there it's there. Now, I'm all connected. I've got the headset connected here. And what I'm going to do now is switch to the BridgeCast app. So this is the BridgeCast app. And as you can see, I'm using my headset. And have I got it? No, it's not muted there. I think it might be muted actually. If I push the button, I have. So it's not muted anymore, which you can see why it's shot up. But yeah, I am using the input at the back here. I'm using the headset option at the back here to use my headset as a microphone. Now, I think that's fantastic. I think that's a fantastic, um, I think that's a fantastic addition to this audio interface. And you can see here, when I'm talking, the levels are bouncing up. You can see my levels. I can control it from the application as well, change the gain level, and I can change the, the headphone volume here as well. Now, you're not actually listening to my headset right now. I'm still connected to my other audio interface. I just want to demonstrate that this is possible but I think this is a fantastic addition to this audio interface because, you know, it means that you don't have to use an XLR microphone. You don't have to use that connection. You can, you know, if you've got your headset, if that's how you connect to friends, if that's what you prefer using, this has support for your headset. It should do anyway. Most headsets should be compatible. You know, headsets that have got the little pull-out microphone. So, yeah, I just wanted to show you that because I think that's a great addition to it. So, yeah, you've, there's, there's a lot of different options here. You know, you've got one XLR input, you've got aux in, you've got your headset option there if you want to use that as well. You've got line out if you want to, you know, send the signal elsewhere. So yeah, very easy to understand. And I'll, I'll say it once again, if you're unsure about these inputs, the inputs here, just refer to the manual. It's got a good detailed overview of what's available at the back. What I would like to do now is show you all the dials, all the buttons, all the controls that are on the top panel of the Roland Bridgecast. But before I do, I just want to state the obvious. Yes, I have had a costume change. And the reason is simple. It's 
15 days after I recorded those original clips. I was working and I had the flu, so I simply just didn't have time to work on the video. And the other obvious thing is that the Roland Bridgecast is now connected up to my PC. All those beautiful colours are showing again. So at the back here, you can see that I've got an XLR microphone, well, an XLR cable, sorry, plugged in here. It goes all the way to my Shure SM7B microphone. And I've also got the headphones plugged in here that come to this headset. And this is indeed a headset. It's a headset. It's not just headphones. So that's how I have it set up. Now, previously, I was using my shotgun, my shotgun condenser microphone above. And when I was using that, I was using it with OBS, like I am just now. And if I jump over to this monitor briefly, the microphone setup that I was using previously, the, the, the shotgun microphone above, was mic with filters. And essentially, I was using filters with the microphone above to, you know, compress the signal, to remove background noise, etc. Now I am using Mic Aux. It's a different setup, a different microphone setup. I'm not using any filters in OBS. And the reason is I've got all these amazing effects here already. You know, I've got all this kind of mic cleanup, low cut compressor. I'll talk about this later on, but that is the reason why right now I'm not using any filters in OBS. I don't believe I need them. Now, the other thing to note here is that uh, previously I had the sync offset as 195 milliseconds. But now I have the offset set as 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. Now, the reason I'm pointing that out is because with my previous setup with the Zoom FE and this microphone, the offset was 185 milliseconds so that the video from my webcam, well, my Sony camera and the microphone so that they're all synced together. But now the offset is only 100 milliseconds. But a word of caution. Don't think because I'm using 100 milliseconds for the sync offset, you should too. It really does depend on your setup. It depends on the microphone you're using. It depends on the camera or the webcam that you're using too. There's a lot of things to consider. So the most important thing is to do testing, test your video, test your audio, and make sure that everything is in sync. So I'm going to be talking about the top panel. And I, I, I keep saying this, I know I keep saying this guys, but I'll, I'll say it again. This whole section, this whole, you know, all the features, all the dials I'm going to explain to you now, they're all explained in the Roland Guide. Please do refer to that. It's a fantastic reference. It will explain everything that I'm going to show you. But hopefully what I'm going to show you will be a very good visual aid. It might, I don't know, maybe it'll just sink in a little bit better when you see me doing it. So as you can see in the top panel, there's a lot of dials here. There's a lot of buttons here. And... You know, like with most audio interfaces, the first time you look at it, it can be a little bit daunting. There's a lot going on here. But when you break it down, it's, it's very, very easy to use. And it, it's a little bit easier to understand simply because they've got a kind of grid system here. So I want to start with mic effects. Now, I'll show you the microphone effects in a second, but basically just to kind of summarize how it works, you can push mic effects. You can see the reverb comes on. You've got five different presets like this. And when you've got that, you can change the pitch and you can change the floor, which changes the character of your voice. That's how it's kind of summarized online. So that's the microphone effect. So I'll show you that in a second, but I want to show you some shortcuts first. Now, what it is, is you hold the mic effects button down and you'll see two separate dials here. They're lighting up. Now, the first one changes the gain level of your active microphone whether it be an XLR microphone or your headset, it will change the gain level. The second dial actually changes between your XLR microphone at the back, condenser or dynamic, whatever you're using, it changes that at the back with the headset. If that's a little bit confusing, don't worry, because I'm going to crudely show you the application itself. So this is the, the, the kind of settings area of the Bridgecast app. And you can see that I have the dynamic microphone selected. So right now I have 45 decibels of gain. So I'm going to hold this in. It's lighting up here. And then I'm going to go down. Bring bringing the gain level all the way back up again. So I'm going to set it back at 45. I don't want to peak too much. But that's effectively what that allows you to do. It allows you to, on the fly, push the mic effects button and then change the gain level. So I'm going to pull this down just now because what the second shortcut does 
is lets you change to the headset. So I'm holding mic effects. These are selected again. And if I just, just turn it once like that, see how it's changing to headset there? So dynamic headset. I'm talking with my headset now. That's what you, you know, the, you'll hear it. You'll hear the audio quality is different. And I'll change back. So right, left, right, left. Now, there I've got it set as the dynamic microphone, but if this was my shotgun microphone above, if I was using phantom power, then it would say condenser microphone. It'd be switching between condenser microphone and the headset. So I'll push this back in. We're back with this microphone. Now, the other shortcut that we have here is holding the mic effects and the select button at the same time. Now, effectively what this allows you to do is switch between a dynamic microphone and a condenser microphone that requires 48 volts phantom power, which you will get from the Bridgecast. So if you had, for example, a condenser microphone selected and you had it selected as dynamic at that point, you wanted to switch on phantom power, you would hold both of these buttons down. And what happens is the five lights above, the one, two, three, four, five, they're not lit. But if you hold it down, You'll see them coming on, and when they're on, that means that you now have condenser microphone selected with 48 volts of power. So it will be silent, but I do want to on screen show you how this shortcut works. So I'm going to hold both buttons. Condenser microphone. Oh, it's probably silent for a little second there, but I did switch from dynamic to condenser, and that's essentially what that shortcut allows you to do. So there's a few shortcuts there for changing the gain level, which is not the output, it's the gain level of the microphone, remember that. And then the second one is changing to your headset, and then that third shortcut there where you hold both buttons is switching between a dynamic and a condenser microphone. And when you do select a condenser microphone, 48 volts of power are ready. Now, I will say, I think it's pretty cool that all those shortcuts are there. But I would also say that for most people, it would be better to test everything, get your microphone level set, you know, make sure you're not peaking set up with whatever, you know, you're recording with. I use OBS, as you know. Get it all, you know, do your test, do your video test, your audio test, make sure it all sounds great, and then you're good to go. Do it in application, and that's how I would handle it. You can do it on the fly with these shortcuts, but if you're in a live stream, you could be changing something, and it might sound great in your ears. It might sound perfect, but the output to everyone else does not sound great. So, you know, if you find a quick mistake during a stream, maybe you could use this to quickly change something, but I, I would always play it safe, in my opinion. Use the BridgeCast app. You know exactly what gain level you're at. You know exactly what microphone you're using. I mean, these shortcuts are nice, but I would always play it safe and use the application. That's just me, but that's how they work anyway. Okay, let's go back to make effects. So like I was saying, you push the, the, the make effects button here and you push on and your make effects go on. And then you push select to cycle through each of these. Now, I'm going to pop this window back up. It's just the easiest way to show you this here. So I'm now in the make effects settings area. So if I switch on, you can see the mic effects button switching on there, and then I've got reverb, maximum reverb, high voice, fat voice, super bowl voice, and then back to reverb. Now, what you'll notice there is that of those five presets, you'll notice, you know, the ones at the end there, all they're really doing is changing the pitch and the formant settings. So if I cycle back to some of them, you can see like the formant changed, the formant is lower, even more for the deeper voice. And essentially what you've got here is five presets, five profiles for these effects. If you wish, you can adjust these. You can change the pitch. You can change it down like that. You can change it all the way up. And you can just adjust things as as And for each of these presets, you can also change the size level. Uh, oops, sorry, I'm doing the wrong screen. I um yep here you can change it up to size 10. you can go back down to two it's not as grand now 
and you can do with a level as well you can increase that you can decrease that and if like me you'll be messing about with it at any point you can just click the reset button and you what well, you guys you guys couldn't see that there because it was on the other screen but if i quickly jump over to the other screen you'll see that when i push the reset button there it just says are you sure yes they have all been initialized so that's it that's that's how that process works so You've got five different presets there with reverb, maximum reverb, high voice, fat voice, low voice, but you can write over those files, you can reset them, you can save your adjustments and just load them every time if you wish. There's a lot of flexibility there, and if you want on the fly during the stream, I'll get that reverb off, during the stream, you can adjust the pitch, you can adjust the format, you can just tweak things as you wish. So I think it's a really good setup because you can set up your profiles and your presets the way that you want, but you can still do things on the fly, you know, during a stream. So the next thing that we see here is the EQ. Now, the EQ is only related to game underneath, and that's why you can see the little arrow here. Now, by default, it's off, but you can see there's five presets, and the five presets are, if I show you, they are for Apex, Valorant, Fortnite, Call of Duty and FPS general. So out of the box, all of these game EQ presets have been set up for first person shooters and you can cycle through them by pressing the EQ select button on the BridgeCast. Now in the BridgeCast app, when no EQ is selected, no preset is selected, you'll see a blue line in the EQ graph. But when you start cycling through the presets, you'll see that the wavelength there is different because the EQ is being applied. And you also see underneath the detail of each of these presets. And you can go in and you can change things. You can adjust things as you see fit. And I'm not an expert on equalizers and you know making everything sound great. But the idea behind this is that you adjust things so that your game sound will pop. So that it sounds amazing. Now, if you're happy with those settings, you can write the settings to a preset, any number that you want, and you can rename the file. But if you're not happy, you can reset those settings. So whilst the presets have been set up for first-person shooters, you can set it up for driving games, for platform games, for any type of game. And yes, there are five presets that you can cycle through here, but you can save profiles for as many games as you want. Dozens, hundreds, thousands, go nuts. You just have to you know, set up the EQ the way that you want it and then save the file to your computer and then you can load it next time you play the game. So I'll, I'll just quickly, uh, yeah, let, let's start on the left-hand side. That makes more sense, right? So we've got the four dials here. We've got microphone, auxiliary, chat, and game. Now, you can see the microphone level is jumping up and down. Um, there's actually an option in system. Is it? Yeah, there's an option in system, which um, I'll show you just now, where under the system setting, you can click level. And you can see that it just shows the level now that you're at rather than the meter jumping up and down. I kind of prefer the meter level, just this, you know, so that I can see that I'm talking to the microphone, I can see some activity, but you can change it to the level if you prefer. So you've got your, your, your four buses here, and the first one is microphone, but you can see I've, got, I've actually got the auxiliary cable plugged in there, and that is connected to my Twitch. So, if I plug in, uh, if I wake up my switch, and like so, I'm going to just bring this down for a second. If I see, so right away you can see that, um, you can see that there's there's volume coming from the switch. And essentially, what I've done here is just plugged in a 3.5 millimeter audio cable, and I've plugged it into the Roland Bridgecast. Now. I'll speak about this more in the next section, but really that auxiliary port is the best way to capture audio from games. It really is the best way and it's the optimal way to do it with this audio device. But you can see there that I was controlling the audio there, you know, up and down. I can change the output there very easily on the fly once you've got audio coming from a device. Now you've got chat and game there. Um, game is something that if your PC gaming is very easy to set up. I'll speak a bit more about game in the next section, but chat is something that I found very, very useful. So when I was learning about the Roland Bridgecast, 
I organized a call with Roland to go over some things. And the chat option was great because I could assign Teams or Discord. I could assign the level coming from someone else and assign it to this. I could assign it to chat and then I could go up and down. And it was it was very, very easy to do that. So it's pretty cool you can do that. Like so imagine you're in a game, for example, and your friend is calling you in Discord, their party chat, rather than their their audio coming through your, your main system, you can assign their audio to chat, all the audio from your friends in the party, and then you can control that audio via the chat dial. It's it's a really, really useful thing. Even not playing games, just, just in a call, I found it really useful because when I was testing this with the gentleman from Roland, I placed his audio in the Microsoft Teams settings to chat, which meant I could put his volume up and down like that at any point. It's very useful, you know, just be able to, you know, you can control your own volume, you control your settings, but you can also lower or increase the, 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 the audio coming from a third party, which in most situations would either be someone you're interviewing for a recording or more likely your friends in a game. So what we've got down here uh, is mute and assign. So if I, it's maybe easier to show you this so I don't go silent, but I'll, I'll, I can show you both. But you can see there's audio here. If I push that, it's muted. Simple. There's no audio now because it's muted. Push it again, and the levels are back. And it's the same for me. If I'm talking in a stream, someone walks into the room, and I don't want you to hear what's being said, I push the mic button. So I can keep talking like that. You won't hear it because it has been muted and you can apply that make that mute button to all of the channels here. Now, the reason it says mute and assign is because the Roland Bridgecast is actually incredibly flexible with how you use these buttons. I'll jump over to the Bridgecast application. I'll take my webcam away so that we can see all of these channel settings. And these channel settings obviously represent what's on the Roland Bridgecast itself. So channel one, it's microphone and the color is yellow. And then we've got aux is red, chat is green, and game is blue. And these are the default out of the box settings for the source and for the LED color, but they can of course be adjusted. So for channel one, for example, I can change it from yellow to red, and then I can cycle through all the colors till I find a color that I like. But I think I'll put it back to yellow for now. But this is maybe something you want to do if you want to change the order of colors or perhaps just make all the channel colors identical so that on screen it looks a little better from a branding point of view. Maybe it matches your profile and your logo, etc. So above here we've got the source and you can see mic, aux, chat and game. But you can see that there's actually seven sources here. Music, system and special effects are also available. So... For my own stream, I'd maybe use microphone and then I'd capture game audio using the aux port. But that allows me to use channel three and four for something else. Maybe I want to assign music in the background or use system sounds. You know, maybe that's something I want to do. So it's quite flexible and it's very easy to adjust. At the right hand side, we have the mute assign button settings. And there's a lot of different options here. The default settings for channels one, two, and three is to mute all, which essentially just eliminates it as a source. So that's what you'd normally want. Well, that's what I would normally want anyway for the microphone and for auxiliary. But the default for channel four is special effects A, which is a dance kick. And there's also a whoosh and there's also a beep. So these special effects are, they're not major functionality. They're maybe a little bit silly, but it's a fun little addition to the Bridgecast and it's something you might want to put into your streams every now and then. But you can see there's a lot of different options here. There's a lot of flexibility as to what you actually assign to that mute assign button. So you've got mute all, mute to stream mix, mute to personal mix. You've got your special effects. You've got mute output all, lots of different mute options there. Different profiles, you've got game EQ, microphone effects, and you've got MIDI. Now, MIDI files are not something that I've had a lot of experience with myself, but I know that there's applications out there such as MIDI Mixer that allows you to use these MIDI files, these options to, well, do anything. You can use a MIDI to 
switch a light on and off. You can use it to switch an application on and off. It's really, really flexible. Now, there might be some of you out there that don't have something like an Elgato you know, Stream Deck or something like that. So you could use this MIDI option here to use one of the assign buttons to turn the light on and off. I'm not saying that's what I would do. I would rather have a Stream Deck, but it does show you how flexible these mute assign buttons are because in addition to different effects, different profiles, different, you know, mute options, you you also have that MIDI option there just, you know, it just opens up a whole other world of possibilities as to how you use the BridgeCast to enhance your live stream. Okay. We're nearly, we're nearly there. We're down at this bottom corner now. We've got stream, we've got line out, we've got mix link, stream mix, personal mix, and phones. Now, the stream mix, personal mix thing is, is something I, I really, really uh, think is fantastic. I think it's fantastic because when you are streaming, when you are recording, what sounds great to you isn't always what sounds great to other people. You know, and so, for example, when I'm, doing a live stream, or if I'm just recording a video, I like to hear the, the microphone a little bit. I, I'm not saying I want to hear myself feed, you know, I don't, I don't want it fed back to me so much that, that it's annoying me, but I, I want to hear what I'm saying so that I can control the volume of my voice, etc. So it's good that you can set up the stream mix and the personal mix separately. So here what we've got is stream. Now, if I adjust that, it's going to use change the output of the stream mix. Now, I'm not going to touch that right now because I'm actually using it. If I mess this setting up, the rest of the video might be at a different audio level. Um, so I don't want to change that just now, but you can see that when I'm talking, you can see the stream mix is bouncing up and down because I've got it set. But if I was using line out, I could adjust line out, just the same as stream, and you know, if I had a cable attached to the back of the bridge cast and I was going to a mixer or another audio device, I could decrease or increase this depending on what I needed from the other setup. So the stream would simply just change the output level, which would change what I'm saying right now. It would be lower or higher. Um, and you could, you've got a physical dial for it. And the reason you, you'll see in the panel there that stream, line out, and phones are kind of grayed out. They're really just there at, as, you know, for an, an ind indication point of view, they're not there for you to change anything. And it's because you've got those physical controls. That's why you can't change anything in the application there. These dials go round and round forever. These are defined. So when you change these, though, you can see them in the application, but you have to change them here. So you've got stream, you've got line out, and you've got headphones. And when I take that down, I can hear myself less. And now it's getting louder. I can hear my microphone louder. So... Great, love it. I, I love a person. I love the physical physical controls here. You just quickly adjust my headphones and things. Works great. So down here we have the stream mix, and then we've got the personal mix. So you can see there when I click that stream mix button, the blue lights come on. So there's no denying that is a stream mix. That is what is going out to the world. When you're you know working with that stream mix, you can put the settings up, and then oh, it's a bit loud for me. I can put it down. But you have this mix link option. And if you push that, it will move both of them at the same time. And once again, I'm going to bring up that little window here to show you what's going on here. So I'll use the auxiliary as an option. So we've got mix link. If I push mix link, you see how that's all connecting, it's connecting all the channels. So what we've got here is we've got Say channel two auxiliary, you've got your personal mix, which is the little avatar of yourself. And then you've got the stream mix, which is like a radio broadcast. If you push mix link and it connects it, then both of those dials are going to go up and down at the same time. Like so. They'll go up and down at the same level. If I deselect that mix link for a second, now it's just normal mode, then you can see the personal mix is going up. See, I want the personal mix low. Push stream mix. I can put the stream mix higher. And if I push the mix link, both of those are going to go up and down. Now, again, you can see, that's a good example there. You can see that the, the personal mix is still lower. It doesn't mean they're always identical. If you want to get them the same, you would have to still get them both kind of up to the same level like that. 
And then once you've got them at the same level, then you can control them. So that's how you use the mix link feature to adjust a channel up or down by the same amount for your stream mix and your personal mix. And I can think of many different situations where that could prove to be very useful. So I have said a few times that in the next section, I'm going to show you how to connect the Roland Bridgecast to a games console. And I do have my Nintendo Switch there. And I've also got my Xbox Series X hooked up already as well in preparation. But before we get there, I think it's important to get your microphone set up. I think it's important to tell you the other half of the story. The first half of the story is, of course, understanding the inputs at the back and understanding this top panel with mic effects, game EQ, channels, mute and assign buttons and all of those outputs. Stream, line out, stream mix, personal mix, headphones. But in addition to that, you have to set up your levels correctly. You need to set up your effects correctly. So, you know, this, this page here is the meters area and it's, it's a great... You know, it's a great way to just kind of look at where your levels are sitting. I would still look at the actual device, the actual rolling bridge cast to quickly check my levels. But I would always have this in the background as well to make sure that everything is set up correctly. Especially if your stream mix and your personal mix are set up a little bit differently. But what I want to focus on is setting up your microphone correctly. Set up the gain level correctly and set up the cleanup correctly. Now... The cleanup is important for me because over the last 20 to 30 minutes when I've been, you know, showing you the top panel, I've been showing you using the XLR microphone here, the Shure SM7B, plugged into the back of the Roland Bridgecast. Now, this is a great microphone, but there's been a lot of times in the last 20, 30 minutes where this hasn't sounded great. It's really not, it's really not been sounding like it should. And the reason for that is there's been a few situations where I turned my head from the microphone or I've not, you know, I've been too close to the microphone. But the main reason is that I've set up the effects to be, well, the cleanup, sorry. I've set up the cleanup effects, the microphone effects to be a little bit too aggressive. Now, this is something I didn't notice in my initial tests before but when you know, and when you're recording in an environment like this, and and you're kind of moving around a lot, that there's you know there's just situations where it just doesn't work out the way that you want it to. So there's been a few situations where the compressors maybe been a little bit too aggressive, so the audio hasn't sounded as good as it should. But thankfully, that is something that I can fix. But before I talk about cleaning up the microphone, I just want to talk about setting your gain level now. It's very easy to do this. You, you choose your dynamic microphone or your condenser or you choose your headset and you've got a lot of gain to, to use here, up to 75 decibels of gain. And obviously, I'm at 45 decibels here. If I go down, maybe very, very low and then I can go up and then I'm going to be peaking and then that's not going to sound good. It's going to be distorted if I hit that higher level. So you want to get to the level where you're kind of approaching this top level, but you're not going over so that you don't get distortion, you're not going to get any kind of audio clipping. Now, one thing I just want to quickly show you before we move on is that, I'll, show, I'll, I'll jump to the overhead camera here. What I want to show you here is the, the FET head. So this is the Triton Audio FET head. Now, I, I, I've used this with my Zoom F8 and I've used it with many other audio interfaces. And essentially what you do with this is you plug it in here and it provides you an extra 27 decibels, up to 27 decibels of clean gain. And generally what that allows you to do is lower the gain setting on the audio interface and you generally get a better sound. So I'm going to put this in just now to demonstrate what I'm talking about. So the FET head is connected as you can see and if I jump back to the window you can see that I now have the microphone type set as a condenser microphone even though this is a dynamic microphone and the reason is simple in order to power this little device I need to provide it with 48 volts of power and that's what I'm doing just now with the condenser option but you can see that no longer am I using 45 decibels of gain I have the gain level set at 18 decibels and that's very low. You know, with the, the rolling bridge cast, I've got up to 75. 
75 decibels of gain here in the preamps, but I'm only using 18. But I can put this up if I want. And the idea with this is, you can see I'm, I'm, I'm reaching the point where I'm ready to peak. Um, but the idea is that by setting this lower, I, I get cleaner gain. Now, this is something that I've set, that I've used with many audio interfaces. I've used this for years. I don't think this is necessary for the Roland Bridgecast because, you know, the 75 decibels of gain that you've got here, I think it's, you know, the, the preamps are clean. I think it sounds good. So I don't think I need this. I really don't. So, yes, I'll take it back off. So I'm back to using the Shure SM7B as a dynamic microphone. The FET head has been taken out. I don't think you need it. So you do have the option of using something like a FET head or a cloud lifter to, you know, increase that gain if you wish. I really don't think you need it with the Roland Bridgecast. You've got up to 75 decibels of gain here. And for most microphones, that's going to be more than enough. I, I don't think you're going to have any major issues with that. So stay if you want it. You can always use these kind of extra little audio tools if you want. I don't think you need it with the Roland Bridgecast. So I've zoomed out a little bit so that you can see the full mic cleanup page because this is an important settings area. This is one of the most important things that you need to focus your attention on. And it requires a lot of adjustments. It requires a lot of tests. And then once you've done all those audio tests, you need to sit back and listen to those differences so that you can pick up anything that is wrong. And I have demonstrated how difficult that can be sometimes because sometimes during your audio tests, everything sounds okay. And then when you go to record, certain things happen and you notice a few things that are wrong. But that's what you just have to do. You just have to get a base level and then keep recording and then just tweak things over time. It can be a difficult balance though, because if your settings are too light, you're going to let some of the rumbles and background noises seep in. If your settings are too aggressive, then, well, I've demonstrated what happens there. It can sound a little bit robotic or you can cut off some of the audio that you want to keep in. So test, test, test. That's what, what my recommendation is. Okay, so there's a few different options here. At the top, we've got low cut. Now, this is set at 40 hertz, but you can go from flat up to 500 hertz. And what this will do is set the baseline. It essentially, you know, eliminates the low frequencies from your signal. It's a very important thing to set. And if you've got it right, you eliminate rumbles and different noises at the bottom end. And it just gives you a cleaner signal overall. Next, we've got noise suppressor. Now, this is fantastic for eliminating background noise you know, regardless of what's going on in the background. For me, I'm, you know, a couple of levels up. So the, the biggest noise for me to try and eliminate is my PC, which is sitting next to me. There's just a constant buzzing, hissing, you know, kind of the hard drives going, etc. You've got all those noises in the background. So when I use a noise suppressor, that's one of the main noises I'm trying to remove. But you can be much more aggressive with this if you wish, and you can you know, put it up to a higher level and you're going to start removing that background noise more aggressively. You can, you know, this is a dangerous filter to use though sometimes because if you set this too high, you're definitely going to start removing audio that you want to keep from time to time. But yeah, this is just something you need to play around with depending on your environment, depending on, you know, if you're in a busy house with family or friends, you might want to set this higher or lower, maybe you're next to traffic. Um, you can, you know, put this off, you can put any of these filters off to really see what they do. But yeah, you need to get that set right. You want to eliminate your background noise, but you don't want to cut out anything that's important. Now, I will say right now, it is sometimes hard to do that. When I'm doing reviews, and I'm doing reviews on my YouTube channel, the noise suppressor does eliminate that background noise from my PC, and it, you know, eliminates some, some noise from the microphone, etc. But what it does do also is sometimes it eliminates noise I want to keep in. So if I'm reviewing something and it, it makes a little bit of noise, some beeps or, you know, something in a phone, that noise is muffled and it's not getting picked up because I'm suppressing that audio. So if you're too aggressive, sometimes you can remove audio that you want to keep. That's the important thing. So you've got the gate level, you can set it any level you want. But the other option here is adaptive. Now, 
the idea of adaptive is just like it says in the tin, it's trying to listen to your environment and then adjust the noise suppressor on the fly. Now, it, it sounds like it works okay in, in certain situations, but I, I'm more of a hands-on type of person. I like to know what it's going to sound like every time. And I would prefer to just set the gate level myself. But I need, I need to do more tests with the adaptive one because I've not really did too many tests on it. I, you know, I know what it does. I, I've did a couple of audio tests, but I really need to test, you know, record with it extensively to see whether I prefer that to gate. At the moment, I prefer to set things myself. I, and, you know, I like to know what the noise level is that I'm, you know, where I'm suppressing things. But the, adapt, the adaptive option is there if you want it. The other option here is de-esser if, you, if you're finding you're, you know, doing a lot of hissing uh, um, in your videos. Certain microphones type, pick up those types of sounds more than others. And it might depend on your own speech patterns as well. But you do have a de here. You can set it 1 to 10, you know, depending how aggressive it is. You can turn it off completely. Um, I found the de is it's one of those ones where I normally turn it on and I set it at a low level because I don't feel that I, I do a lot of hissing myself um, in videos and in, in recording. Perhaps because of the microphones I use, perhaps because of me, I don't know, but it, it's something I don't usually set too aggressively, but it is there, it is designed to remove the kind of hissing sound that you get from some microphones. Now, next up we have the compressor. Now, if I hide myself for a second like that, you can see all the settings here. You've got the threshold, which is when it kicks in. You've got the the, the ratio of how it's going to be uh, attacked. You've got the attack milliseconds. You've got the release, and then you've got the post gain, and um, which is, just sets the, the gain level up. Now, I don't want to spend all this video talking about uh, audio compression or what a, a compressor does, but effectively, and a very uh, basic explanation of it is that. It will, it will basically, you've got your wavelength here like this and it will compress that wavelength. And what that does at the top end is it stops clipping and what it does at the bottom end, end is it lowers, it, it, it takes those low sounds and it increases it. So all of a sudden your low sounds, if you're away from the microphone like that, your low sounds will sound higher and you're, you, when you're peaking and you're speaking too loud or you're closer to the microphone, those sounds will be brought down. Now... Like I said, the compressor is something that you can set it too aggressively and it will really ruin your audio. But the compressor can also make your audio sound amazing. So what I recommend you do with this is switch it off like this, like I'm doing just now. See what it does for you. And then switch it on and then start looking at some settings. Now, the default settings that Roland provide are a great starting point. But I would also recommend looking online, looking at some articles, you know, looking at the, the the pros and the cons for setting a, a high attack ratio, for setting the release at certain levels. Generally speaking, the more aggressive you are with it, it will, you know, handle clipping and different things like that better, but it can make your sound uh, a little bit robotic. And, you know, like I said, hands, <laughs> I need to put my hands up here. I have not adjusted this enough yet for this setup. I'm hoping this sounds okay, but... I, I, I need to spend more time tweaking this to get it right for this microphone and, and my setup here. But it's a very, very powerful tool. Just make sure you do a lot of audio tests with it. Read articles about, you know, example settings. But the default settings with the Roland provider are a great sort of starting point. So the last option down here we have is the EQ. And you can see that you can go into great detail here if you wish. And you can adjust all the different EQ levels. And I, I've said this many times, but when it comes to EQ, I use it in a very limited way. And when I do adjust things, I tend to look at guides and I look at references to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. But an EQ is there if, if you're an audiophile, if you know what you're doing, the EQ is there. I think for most people, what you'll be doing is enabling the low cut, the noise suppressor, the de and the compressor. And you'll just be tweaking those settings until your microphone sounds right. Just be you know, careful of the fact if they're too aggressive, your audio can start sounding quite bad. So do lots of tests. So in the BridgeCast application, I've showed you how you can switch between different microphone types and how you can 
change the gain level as you see fit. If you prefer, you can use the Make Effects button and change the gain level here and change the microphone type there. But I generally prefer to use the settings page here so that I can see at a glance, you know, whether I'm peaking or not. The other option here we've got is mic cleanup and we've got the low cut filter, the noise suppressor, the DS, the EQ and the compressor. Now, I think the microphone setup and the microphone cleanup setting pages are the most important thing that you'll see in the Rolling Bridgecast application. And that is because those setting pages ensure that your microphone sounds right. It ensures that your microphone sounds good and it ensures that you eliminate background noises and other things that you just don't want seeping into your recording. So those are the most important setting pages in my opinion, but there's a lot of other options here. So I just want to quickly run through the other options, the other settings that are available in the Bridgecast application. So we've touched upon mic effects already, so I'll run through this. We've got reverb, maximum reverb, high voice, fat voice, super low voice. Like so. Now, if I quickly bring this over to my, um, I'll bring this over to my other monitor because what I want to show you is something that you've probably seen, and you've probably seen this in all, all the different setting pages is that you've got this option to write, reset. You'll see that here, write, reset, save file. Now, when you go to write, you're overwriting the preset and when you click it, you can rename it whatever you want and you can assign it to any of those presets. But you've also got the option to reset, save the file and load the file. But the right option is quite good because it allows you to quickly change what the presets are selected. So it's quite a good option and I, I like how flexible that is. It's pretty good that they allow you to do that. So you've got your mic effects there and the next option we've got is game. And this is another thing that I went over earlier on. By default, this game EQ is off, but you can select to Apex, Valorant, Fortnite, Call of Duty, or first person shooter general. They're all first person shooters anyway, but you you know, if you've got another game, a different type of game, a platform or a racing game, you might want to get into the EQ. You might want to overwrite some things and change some of these presets to suit the game that you're playing. So some cool options. So the next option we've got here is chat and the chat settings page actually has a compressor and a de -esser. Now these uh, cleanup tools work in the exact same way as they do for your own microphone. But the difference here is that the compressor and the de are here are being applied to the audio coming from the chat channel. So imagine you're in a party with your friends, one person, multiple people, you can apply a compressor and a de to their signal, to their audio. So if they're peaking a lot, if their audio just doesn't sound great, you can use the compressor and the de to tidy it up. Hopefully in the future, we'll see the other cleanup tools added to the chat option as well, but it's, it's a nice little feature. Then we've got output. And here we've got a delay of 100 milliseconds by default. You can of course change this. And this is something that you'd have to mess around with to, you know, see what the right setting is. Essentially, what, you, what you'd be doing here is if you're outputting a signal from the Roland Bridgecast using the line out option and you're going to a mixer or an effects, you know, device, any other kind of audio device, when you send that signal out from the Roland Bridgecast, there might be a delay at the other end. There's going to be some latency. You know, sometimes audio devices, they just, there's always just a little bit of a delay. So if you need to delay uh, that output there, you can do it there. You can do it in this settings area. So it's a nice little feature. It's something that you only have to do once you've got this align out somewhere. If something doesn't sound right, you can go back and you can tweak the settings here, decrease or increase the settings until you get the audio synced correctly with your other device. So uh, you've got different options here. By default, the line out mode is actually stream mix. I've just been messing about with the settings. The default option for line out is stream mix, but you can set it to your microphone or phone sync, but stream mix is the default. And likewise with USB out mode mobile console, you can select to uh, select stream mix or select microphone. So you've got a few different options there with the USB out option with mobile console and with your line out port. So next we've got um, the channel options. Now I showed you this earlier on, so I don't have to I don't have to delve too deep in with this. 
Um, you've got the different mic sources and the mute assign buttons. And I suspect most people, when they get that, um, you know, the mic assign button is for game, they'll just play about with the different effects like that. But the other option that you've got there is to change some colors as well. So you can see like the first one, the first option there is yellow. But if I wish I can, you know, I can change this to purple. And then when you go back, you'll see that it's purple. And you can just change this around any way you want. Put any color you want there. And yeah, just adjust things. So you can put those colors to anything you want to your favorite colors. You could put them all the same color if you're if you're looking for branding purposes to get them all synced together. Yeah, it's up to you what you do there. So the next option we've got here is profiles. And this is actually one of the coolest features of the BridgeCast application because you can set different profiles for different scenarios. So the scenarios here are a dynamic microphone, a condenser microphone, a headset microphone, voice change and reverb and game EQ. But essentially what you're doing is just setting up different profiles for different situations. So you can imagine right now I'm using a dynamic microphone. I've got I've got my cleanup settings at a, you know in a certain way. I've got my gain level at a certain point and I've got different settings adjusted for this microphone. But if I change to my headset, well, I'm going to want it to be a little bit different. So it's good you can you can just adjust things and then save them and make sure that you've got everything set up correctly. Now, right now I've got my settings set up the way they are. You saw that 45 decibels, etc. But if I click dynamic microphone, it's going to load that profile. So, I've clicked the microphone like that. And what it's done here for a start, I actually put my gain level up. So the default setting is too high. So I need to overwrite that. I need to go back and overwrite that profile setting because it's, it's a little bit too high for me the way that I've got it set up. The other thing it's done is it's turned off the DSR and it's changed it to adaptive noise suppressor. So again, I need to change that back. So the profile option is very, very powerful, but also be careful with it because you might find, like I just did there, is that you've got your settings, you know, a certain gain level, certain effects. Maybe you've got your compress compressor set up a, a, in a certain way. If you double click one of these and you may override your settings, so make sure you save your settings before you start messing about with the profile option. Save what you've got just now, even save the file so that you've got there, got it there as a backup. But it's a really powerful tool. It's good that you can switch between different profiles there. Next up, we have system. So you can change the LED brightness. You saw earlier that you can change uh, between level and meter. So you've got level there or you can change the meter where it goes up and down. So that's quite a cool option. You've got phones gain, normal, boost, boost two, boost one, boost two. Update the firmware, backup, restore, factory reset. And the last option is rolling cloud. This is a feature that's coming soon. It's gonna give you access to a library of music and effects that you can introduce into your streams and to your videos. What I'd like to do now is talk about how you can use the Rolling Bridge Cast as an audio mixer, an audio interface, in your game streaming setup. Now, in preparation for this section, I have connected my Xbox Series X, and I've connected it up to my PC using the Elgato 4K60 Pro Mark II PCI Express capture card. Now, Elgato obviously have many other capture cards, and there's many other you know, game capture cards on the market. I do have a few other Elgato capture cards myself, but I'm really just capturing that just now, really as a reference point. I'm not going to be game recording or game streaming. I'm just showing you that's how you connect it to your PC. And moving forward, I am going to assume that you have a basic understanding of how game capture devices work and that they sit in between your PC and a dedicated gaming PC or gaming console and they capture video and audio footage and hopefully if you're watching this you already have a basic game streaming set up, set up already you've got an understanding of how it works and hopefully you've done some game streaming already so that you've got a reference point because what I'm going to be talking about here really is just some recommendations I'm not going to be giving you a definitive this is how you game stream with the bridge cast I'm just going to give you suggestions so that I point you in the right direction depending on your setup and I'll give some recommendations as to what I think 
are some good setups. Now, if you look at the amazing rolling guide, which I've referenced a few times. Now, I've said many times in this video that this is a fantastic guide, and it is, but this is probably one of the pages, one of the areas that they've not covered that well. You can see here in the section entitled connecting to a video game console, they suggest changing the switch from PC to console mobile. But as you know, when you do that, you don't have access to all channels, you lose you know, a lot of the options that you have there, and it makes the Rolling Bridge Cast a kind of limited device. And I don't think what they're showing here would be a great setup for modern game consoles or even a, a dual PC streaming setup. So that reference is there, you know, reference this page if you wish, but I'm going to be talking about some alternative options because I think it's better to use the PC option so that you have, you know, access to all of these channels, even if you only use a few of them. Because that's really what you want to do. You want to take advantage of these channels to suit your streaming setup. Let's think about a very simple, practical, I guess, but not always, but a simple setup where you have one PC or one gaming laptop where you game and stream in the same computer. Now, this is not something I recommend generally because... You know, there's just more things that can go wrong. If the game crashes, your stream goes down. It, it's just not ideal. But if you're if you're streaming, if you're playing like retro games and you know old games that aren't really putting too much pressure on your PC, that you know that that's kind of low risk. Now, imagine you're you're gaming on the same PC that you're streaming. You set your microphone here, so you've got your XLR microphone there. You can put an auxiliary if you want, connect your tablet or something else, or connect to another device if you want. Then you've got chat and you've got game. Now this is where if you're, you know, connect, if you're playing a game directly on your PC, this is where you can use all four controls because if you're playing with your friends on Discord or Teams, if you're communicating using an um, a dedicated audio application, then what you can do, if I go over here, if, if you're using Discord, for example, to, you know, chat with your friends, what you can do is make sure that you go into your team settings or your Discord settings and you make sure that chat is set as the output device so that when all their audio comes in, when they're talking to you, it's not just going to system, it's going to chat. And the reason you want to do that is so that you can control their audio here and you can turn their, you know, both for the stream mix and for the personal mix, you can turn their volume up or down. If you've got a friend that's really loud, you can turn them down on the stream if you wish. And it's the exact same situation with the game. Exact same situation. So you're playing a game on your PC, then what you want to do is go into the game settings and you want to output all the audio to game. You want to output all of that game audio to game. And when you do that, you can now control your game audio here. You can make it louder for yourself with the personal mix. You can reduce it a little bit for the stream mix so that people can hear you. But you've got that control. And that's really what this is. You know, when you've got it in PC mode, you can control your microphone, auxiliary, your chat settings, and your game settings. You can control all those channels individually. So if you're streaming directly from your PC, this is also where you're gaming, you can route your audio to the game channel. You can route your chat to the a chat channel, simple, effective. That is the way to go. If you're you know, playing retro games in your stream, you're doing everything in one computer, that's what you do. Just change your audio settings in the application to go to chat and game. That's it. That's how I would do it. Now, for most other people, what you're doing is connecting a game capture device, in my case, an Elgato. But what you're doing is capturing the video and audio using a game capture device. Now, in that scenario, the auxiliary port is the most practical way to do it. But that there, there are there are kind of workarounds that you can do to route that audio that you capture from the game to this game channel. Now, I've not did this yet myself, but I have did similar things in the past with other audio in interfaces and with other video capture devices because I've used a lot in the past. Um, and Essentially, what you need to do is when you when you connect a, a game capture card, you're capturing that video and audio. What you want to do with that audio is route the audio from the game to that game channel. 
And you can do that using many different voice routing applications. Now, the one that I've used a lot in the past is called Voice Meter. It's free to download in a limited way. This company actually has many different um, audio applications. And what you can do with this application is you could bring in the audio. So you can output the audio in OBS, for example. You bring it in in your Elgato Capture device. You output the audio to Voice Meter here. And then you would route that audio back to that game channel. Now, I will say about Voice Meter is, you know, I've used it many times in the past. I've used it over the years, many, many times. It can be a little bit tricky at times. It sometimes doesn't seem to do what you want it to do. But it is possible to use software like that to write audio to the channels that you want. And that's one way in which you could use a game capture device to write the audio to the game channel. And once again, that gives you the, the ability to control the game audio using the hardware control here. And you can change it as you see fit. I've not done this myself. I've just not had time to do that. But it is possible to use applications like that. Now, what I would say about that, though, is it's not the perfect setup. The perfect setup with the Roland Bridgecast, in my opinion, you know, this might differ from what Roland say, but in my opinion, the best way to capture audio with the Roland Bridgecast is to have your microphone here and use this auxiliary port to capture audio from your game system. Now, in the Nintendo Switch, that is actually quite easy. It's quite easy to use the auxiliary port to put all your game audio here and then you can adjust things. Now, it's easy because what you have to do here is HDMI out. So you'd put, this would go to your video capture device, Elgato, whoever, and that would capture your video and audio, but there's no audio outputs or anything like that there, but the switch does have a headphone port at the top. So what you can do is, Leave this docked, have it connected, you know, using the HDMI cable to your uh, game capture device, capture the video, but then you can game using your Switch Pro controller, whatever you want to use. But the interesting thing with the Switch is when the Nintendo Switch is, is docked, you can still use the headphone jack here. You can still use that. So you can see the audio there. Now, I don't know, obviously, I don't have this docked right now. I don't actually have it turned on. But when this is docked and you have it plugged in, you can still route the audio there and it will still go through the auxiliary port. Switch is quite interesting that way. There's not a lot of games consoles that allow you to do that. But what it means is that using just a 3.5 millimeter cable, you might have to buy a long cable depending on your setup, but you can just plug it into your Switch, use the Joy-Con controllers or the Switch Pro controller to play the game, leave it docked, and then just plug the audio from the headphone port of the Nintendo Switch into the auxiliary port here. Now you've captured your game audio. Now you just have to make sure that you've got the game audio and the game video in sync. Set the offset, you know, in OBS or whatever to make sure everything's okay. And that's it. Perfect setup. That That is the perfect setup. And that really is the perfect setup with the Rolling Bridgecast. Use your microphone here. Use auxiliary to capture the game audio. Use chat for Discord. And you can use this, well, for anything really, as you saw earlier, you can use it for effects, you can use it for music in the background, you can use this for a lot of different things. I think, personally, I think that's the best setup. And it gives you more control over your audio and it's just a lot simpler to set up, you know, than messing around with, with voice meter. And one thing I would say about an application with voice meter as well, voice meter is an incredible tool and there's a lot of other incredible audio tools out there. But, but, I would always say a hardware solution is better than a software solution. If you can resolve this audio problem that you have with capturing audio from games consoles, if you can route that audio from the games console into the BridgeCast using hardware, using a physical cable, I think that's better than software. One less application to worry about, you know, messing up, less fidgeting about with audio controls, it just works. I would definitely go down that route. Now, the problem is, how do you capture audio from like an Xbox Series X or PlayStation 5, etc.? Because I know with my Xbox Series X, there's no optical output. There's nothing there to allow me to capture the audio. So what do you do? 
So this is something which I was hoping to have tested by now, but I, I've not had a chance to buy the product. But what you need to do is go on to eBay or Amazon or any store online and look for an HDMI audio extractor. That's what you need to look for. And what that's going to allow you to do is take that HDMI signal, take it out, but also extract the audio at the same time. And you'll see lots of different options here. You can see like there's the optical out port, HDMI out, but here now you've got an optical out port which you can put to speakers, you can put to headphones, you can put to the Roland Bridgecast. So there's lots of different variations here and you know, depending on the system that you've got, you might have to pick one option over another. You know, for example, Xbox Series X uses HDMI 2.1. So there's lots of different options here. I've not tested all of these. The, the range from very cheap to quite, ex, you know, kind of 100 bucks marks, uh, 100 bucks. But that's essentially, fundamentally, that is what you need to do. You need to take that HDMI signal from your games console and you need to extract the audio from the HDMI signal. This is something I'm going to be buying soon. It's something I'm going to be playing around with. But that's essentially what I recommend. If you've got a modern games console, get an HDMI extraction tool and capture that audio separately because it gives you so much control. If you can capture that audio separately, you can route it into the rolling bridge cast. You can control it through that auxiliary port. Now you do have options. You can maybe figure this problem out using software to route things to the game channel. I think a physical cable is always going to be better than trying to route audio in different places. So that's my recommendation, guys. It's a little bit easier with the Nintendo Switch because you can use uh, the headphone uh, port at the top here. But if you do have an HDMI extraction uh, box, I would say that's still a better option for the Nintendo Switch as well, rather than, you know, having the, the headphone jack there. So that's everything I have to say about connecting the Rolling Bridgecast. This is something that game streamers in general have, you know, had to kind of deal with with modern games consoles. Uh, modern game consoles, there just isn't enough audio out options in modern consoles. Certainly not to make our life easier, but... It's not it's not really that expensive to pick up an HDMI extraction tool. You just have to, you know, pick up one of these little boxes, route your HDMI through one of these so that you capture the audio. And once you've got that audio, it's you're good to go. So there you have it, guys. This has been, to state the obvious, a very long tutorial. But I hope you found it useful. Hopefully you've been navigating between all the different sections and hopefully you do have an understanding now as to how you can use the Rolling Bridgecast mixer and audio interface. You should now understand how to use the inputs, the dials and the Bridgecast application itself. I have to give a huge thank you to Roland themselves for sending out the device and for taking the time to sit in with me in a call because I had a lot of questions at one point as to how to use this and they were very kind enough to answer all of them and that's helped me to create this tutorial for all of you. I have now had this for two and a half months or so and I've done a huge amount of tests with many different microphones and you saw that through this video that I do like this. I think it's a premium product, I think it looks fantastic and I love the fact it's low latency, I love the preamps on this, you know 75 decibels of gain and once you get by that initial teething stage of not knowing how it works and once you know how this works alongside the Bridgecast application, you do realise that this is a fantastic audio interface. I just love how there's four different channels here that I can select. You know, I can I can bring in different sources, you know, calls in the chat option here, auxiliary, I can put the game through there and I can use the game option for something else if I wish. There's just a lot of flexibility here and I love the principal feature here of having, you know, dual bus, of having a stream mix and a personal mix so that you can adjust the volume differently for your audience as for yourself. So I've been very, very impressed with it. I will be using this more in the future. Now, one of the things that I've tried to stress throughout this video is the importance of testing. Testing your setup, testing your microphone, testing your microphone effects and cleanup settings. And I demonstrated that in probably the worst way possible by 
having a clip that was 20 or 30 minutes long where I had set my noise suppression and noise uh, suppression and compression settings a little bit too aggressive. So the result of that was that there was quite a few points where I was talking and my volume went up and then it went down and then parts of my, my speech were being kind of cut off. I think it sounded a little bit robotic. So it wasn't great, but that was a result of me just going back and forth with testing so much and then I didn't revert those changes. But in the spirit of testing and experimentation, well, you can see that I'm not using my Shure microphone here with the headphones. I'm actually using my other microphone. And you can see the, the green XLR cable here. And if I give you a very crude behind the scenes here with my GoPro, you'll see that this is my Audio-Technica shotgun microphone. This is what's recording my audio just now. And yeah, you can see that's what I'm recording with right now. So that's what's kind of hidden out of shot. And I assumed I was going to have to do a lot of experimentation, a lot of testing with it. But all I had to do was change it to condenser microphone in the BridgeCast application. And then I just changed from gate noise suppression to adaptive. And that's how I have it set up just now. That's all I've done to switch from the Shure SM7B, uh, which is quite a clean microphone, you know, it doesn't pick up a lot of background noise, to my condenser shotgun microphone that picks up everything in the background, all the PC noise. So it's quite good that I can switch between these two microphones very easily. I don't have to adjust many settings. I just, you know, changed the gain level, which uh, you might have noticed there that I had to drop the gain level down from 45 decibels down to 15 decibels. Very easy to do. So it just shows you that you can switch between your dynamic microphones and your condenser microphones as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've had a lot of fun delving deep with the Roland BridgeCast. I'm looking forward to what they do in the future with the application. I'm sure they're going to tweak things a little in the future. And I have no doubt that this is going to prove to be very popular with game streamers. Thanks for watching everyone. If you've got any questions, please do post them down below in the comment area. Please do check out my short review as well. And until next time, take care.